Hey, what's up guys? SCG Filmmakers here, man. I just want to lay out just a few ground rules when it comes to this video and what its intent is. The intent of this video is to just literally show you some of the equipment that I chose to work with when it comes to the Pocket 4K. Now I've been shooting with this camera for almost two years now. I'm coming from the Sony a7 III. The Sony a7 III, great camera. I really didn't have any like huge issues with it. Um, some of the takeaways coming from a Sony ecosystem and then moving into kind of like a more cinema camera would be just the overall look. As you guys know, man, the, the, the Sony's and the Canon's great cameras, they just, to me, they don't, they don't look, they don't produce the same image quality coming out of like a Blackmagic or a Zcam or like even a C500. It's just the overall image quality is something that I was going for. The overall color science of this camera is something that I was looking towards uh, getting into at the time. And even though the Sony boasts like a higher dynamic range, this camera just has a more usable dynamic range. And I'm not gonna get into like the super specifics on what that means, but this, this camera here only is rated at like 13 stops of dynamic range. I understand that the Sony's are like 14 and a half or 15 or whatever they are, but it just, it doesn't look the same way it does when you drag it into an editing suite. Anyways, man, this whole video is not necessarily talk about like why I switched over to Sony Blackmagic two years ago. It's to actually just take a look at some of the things that, that I'm working with or chose to work with when it comes to this camera. And so anyway, man, we'll go ahead and start off with the monitor. This is the Andy Cine 4K, it accepts 4K inputs. It doesn't, it doesn't like show a 4K image, it only shows a 1080 image, but that's even more than some of the small um, HD monitors. Some of them only show 720. And given, given the price point, this monitor uh, is, is a pretty good deal. I think right now it runs about $160. If I'm not mistaken, check on Amazon. I'll put, I'll put um, some links in the description below so that you can reference uh, some of this equipment that I'm talking about. And later on, we'll talk about like some of the different ways I'm using this monitor in order to power the camera itself. I'm still using the Samsung T5 SSD, man. This is the same stuff that I bought literally when the camera, or when I first bought the camera two years ago. Obviously, you know, we got the Tilta and all the cage stuff that looks really cool, man. And I, you know, it, unfortunately that stuff wasn't out when I first purchased my camera. I'm really digging like, you know, the wireless follow focuses and all that stuff, but I don't, I have to be brutally honest with you guys, man. I, I just honestly don't have any particular issues just turning the focus wheel on the lens. It's just, I'm not gonna lie, man, I, I might need it. <laughs> I might need it, like, I don't know when, but I just, for right now, I just, I just don't need it. It seems more of a hindrance for me more than anything just because now I have to keep that item of equipment charged and make sure that it doesn't die. I gotta attach one more thing to the lens if I need to switch out lenses. Trust me, I'm not hating. I just don't have any particular problem turning the focus ring on the lens itself. It's just, I don't know, maybe that's just me. So yeah, man, I'm shooting on the T5. I'm shooting on the SSD. Sometimes I do shoot just using a regular SD card. It just depends on, on the type of work I'm doing. Obviously, it's in a small rear cage and it came with like the top handle. I think I bought it as a kit at the time. We have a matte box here just for me to use like ProMist filters, ND filters, graduated ND filters or whatever I need to do. I could just slide them both in here. This particular matte box allows you to put two four by four filters inside of it and also allows you to kind of spin or oscillate one of them just in case you decide to use like a um, polarized circular filter inside the inner one. And on the outside one, I kind of just leave the ProMist um, in there indefinitely. I never take it out. I want to talk about lenses because I've literally used every configuration that you could probably think of when it comes to lenses for this camera. You can use a speed booster or a focal reducer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this particular one is a Viltrox, um, a Viltrox uh, focal reducer. I've had some videos I've watched where people have had issues with this. It's not, it doesn't fit on like snugly onto the mount. I personally haven't had those issues. I don't know if I have like a special focal reducer or anything, but this one doesn't move around at all uh, when I put it on the camera. I've used native glass when it comes to this camera. I have a few pieces of native glass here. I have a, a 14, which actually a good, a good buddy of mine let me have this. I appreciate that. Jones Media, make sure y'all go and check 
his channel as well. He loves to shoot cars. So if that's something you guys are into, uh, make sure you shoot over there and check out some of his content. I did an entire video kind of in a vlogging scenario on the pocket using the 14 mil Lumix F25. You can check it out right here. But yeah, man, I've got native glass. I've got um, vintage glass. I've got this Canon 135 F28. I've got a Super Tacomar uh, 50 1.4. And I just got, I have a wide variety of different configurations that I've been using throughout the two years that I've been shooting on this camera. And this is gonna be my whole takeaway, like whether or not you should use a focal reducer, whether or not you should use native glass or just adapt uh, vintage glass straight on to, you know, straight on to the Micro Four Thirds mount, but whatever you've been thinking about. And like I said, man, this is just, something that I found that works best for me. It, it makes sense in my head. If I have the ability to get a stop of light back, if I need it, if I also have the ability simultaneously to get just a little bit of focal range back from the lenses, and also as well, you have that characteristic of getting that stop back and just the overall look of the image. When it comes to depth of field, then I'm telling you, man, I went both ways. I went, when I first got this camera, I shot with a focal reducer with a Sigma 1835, the 1.8. I loved it, didn't have any issues with it, but then I just felt like I needed to like just try other things. Then I went through kind of a phase where I was just shooting with nothing but native glass. I'm serious, like if it wasn't native glass, it wasn't going on the camera. I went through like maybe six months of that. Then I went through a whole vintage phase to where it was like, if it's not vintage, it ain't getting put on the camera. So I went, I went through quite a bit of different phases when it comes to lenses in this camera. And so I guess my major takeaway right now is that this is a good thing. I don't think that there is really any situation where this is a bad thing. Um, I've had some instances or some videos that I've seen where, um, you know, different people on different channels talk about this loses sharpness when your camera sensor has to look through another piece of glass and then go through your actual lens from the time it actually processes into the sensor you lose sharpness or whatever that didn't bother me because i don't need to see every single piece of wrinkle and pore in people's face or i don't need to see every grain of sand you know it, if if that's a drawback by using a focal reducer is that the image comes out just a little less sharp then then i'm going to use this on purpose because i i don't like i don't know man i just don't like super sharp images I don't like images that, you know, the Sony a7 III is producing. It was just too digital looking, too much sharpness in, in some of those cameras and some of those lenses. And so that got me really thinking into the vintage lens options and, and uh, what basically what options I have afforded to me on that end. I started getting to think about the Canon FD lenses. I started looking at the auto Shinons, which are like, a, I don't know whether they're, whether they're a knockoff of the FD lenses or not, but they produce a really good image as well. I already had the Super Tacomar, so I really had some good experience with what the Pentax uh, Super Tacomar lenses look like. When I first put this 51.4 that I have on here right now, I do know that the day I put it on and I turned on the camera and I saw the image through the monitor, I knew that that was it. <laughs> as soon as I saw that image, man, I knew that that was the look that I wanted. Now, obviously I still keep, I still, you know, kept my options open. I started looking around. I got this FD 135 uh, 2.8 and it, it just, nothing beats the way the Super Tacomar lenses render images, man. I'm telling you, if you guys can ever get your hands on a Super Tacomar, whether it's the 50 1.4 or the 85 uh, 1.8, they even make a 55 millimeter 1.4, I believe. I think it's actually a 1.2. Get your hands on it, they're super cheap. You can find them for 50, 60 bucks. If you don't like it, you can just sell it for 50 or 60 bucks. But I can pretty much promise you that you're gonna love these Super Tacomar lenses. Now the Canon FD lenses look dope. I'll refer you guys to a video that I checked out um, a few months ago by Media Division. If you guys didn't get a chance to check out that video, it's like a two hour film on the Canon FD lenses. Make sure you guys go and check that out. I'll put a link down in the description below. Super in-depth and very entertaining video on all of the Canon FD um, lenses. So the issue you're gonna run into is that you are actually gonna have to switch out the entire mount on the lens, like the physical mount, like unscrew it, take apart the lens 
install an, an EF mount, they call it hard mounting. You can actually check out um, a website called SimMod where you can actually send the lenses in and have them professionally done. They actually like rebearing the focal ring. They basically tune up your lens, make it brand new again, but it's expensive, man. You're looking at two, three, sometimes $400, depending on the actual lens that you're sending to them and the condition that it's in. They have kits you can buy where you can like DIY, just kind of do it yourself, take off the lens, install a EF mount onto that FD lens, but I just, I wouldn't feel in that. And so from the time I calculated the cost of actually purchasing, you know, a set of FD lenses, convert them all over into EF so I could use it with a micro four thirds to EF focal reducer, you're looking at Oh, well over $1,500 for that whole set of lenses. And these are vintage lenses, which, you know, one of the major advantages to be able, being able to use vintage lenses is, is the fact that they're affordable. So essentially, if I'm going to spend, you know, thousands of dollars on vintage lenses, then it, it's kind of defeating the purpose. Which brings us back to the Super Tacomar lenses. The Super Tacomar lenses is an M42 mount. You can easily adapt M42 to EF mounts. It's just, you just literally screw it on and it goes right on to the uh, focal reducer, which is an EF, uh, which is an EF mount. These adapters only run from like seven to $14. So that's a whole lot better than sending my lens off somewhere for two, $300 in order to get it converted over to EF. And not to mention, I already like the look of the Super Tacomar lenses kind of more than the FD lenses. The FD lenses are a little bit less characterized, or should I say the Super Tacomar lenses have more of like a warm tone to them that I do like. And so, yeah, man, I went I went with the M42. Another option that you guys also can look into if you're looking at um, outfitting this camera with vintage lenses is looking into the Auto Shannon lenses that I talked about earlier because you can order them in M42. And so if you do like get your hands on a set of Auto Shannon M42s, you can easily do like I just did with the Super Tacomars. You can just put the adapter on it and then use it along with a focal reducer as well. I, I'm telling you, man, I fought it. I, I was with it. I fought it. And then I started, I, I fought it for a long time. And the reason why I fought it is because I was watching other YouTube videos about people saying that it sucks and don't use them and all this stuff. But you know, after all that fog died down and all the dust settled from, you know, whether or not to use a focal reducer on the Pocket 4K. For me, myself, I like the look that this focal reducer and I like what it does to the footage within this camera, especially when using it with um, with benches lenses. It's, it's super dope. I ain't got no issues with it. The footage coming out of this camera using the Super Tacomar lenses are just Can't explain it, man. You just have to see it yourself. If you're in the search for the ultimate setup when it comes to mobility, when it comes to the pocket, I have a pretty good solution for you if you do have a monitor that has DC out. I talked about this Andy Cine 4K monitor earlier. It does have a DC out, 4K in, 1080 out, false colors, zebras, histograms, focus peaking, the whole nine. You may have just got your camera in the mail and you don't have all the accessories and you're still kind of waiting for them to come in. You may be looking for alternate solutions for this camera in terms of holding it and being more mobile. You may not be interested in using a camera cage or V-mount batteries or extra battery accessories that other people are typically using with this setup. What we have is a really simple handheld solution that you may or may not be interested in. Along with that, this setup right here is gonna take the Andy Cine 4K monitor that we talked about earlier and use it just like a battery mounting solution. In this setup, we're gonna be using the Sony MPF batteries on back of the Andy Cine 4K monitor. If you don't have this monitor specifically, just make sure that the monitor that you are using has a DC out because we're gonna be using that to go into the camera using a dummy battery. On the back here, we have a simple swivel arm that you can purchase from Amazon, they run pretty cheap. I'll put that in the description below and it's just simply mounted to the camera mounting plate here on the bottom. This is gonna allow us to angle this monitor up for low angle shots. Stick the battery inside the monitor. This is just a 22 milliamp battery, but you can choose to use the 8800 ones or whatever size you decide to use. And this monitor just mounts on top just like this. Disadvantages for this setup are the lack of a top handle and as well, the battery power isn't gonna last quite as long as a V-mount or a larger MPF battery source. But like I said earlier, you can always exchange this smaller MPF that I'm using in this setup in particular and replace it with a larger one. 
The major advantage to this setup is that if you are on any shoots or if you have any projects that you're working on that require you to be a little bit more inconspicuous, like at let's say a funeral or a wedding, this setup is gonna allow you to be able to do that. This setup is definitely lighter, but not so light to where it's gonna start to introduce micro jitters into your footage. And if you do decide to put in the larger MPF battery, which I probably would recommend, that in turn is gonna stabilize your footage just a little bit better. Other than that, guys, that's about all I have for you uh, when it comes to this setup in this video. If you guys have any questions about anything you guys saw um, or anything I talked about in the video, man, make sure you guys hit me up in the comments below. I appreciate you guys stopping by and enjoy the rest of your time on YouTube.